started. Um, let's see if we can make this do something. Good. Um, we're here to talk about building FreeBSD with BMake. I'm going to do a quick intro. Um, the question came up recently on the developers list, why BMake? I'll, I'll briefly talk about that. Um, I'll talk about the transition of FreeBSD to using BMake. And uh, one of the reasons for giving this talk is to provide a venue for people who have questions to ask them. So if you have any questions, feel free. Um, uh, I'll then talk a bit about the meta mode and Duradeps builds and projects BMake where you can find them and play with them, which was to a large extent the reason for this whole exercise. So I started BMake um, back in the early 90s. Up until then, I'd been mostly a Sun OS guy, and because Sun, in their wisdom, didn't provide a uh, tool chain, everybody used GMake and GCC and so on. Um, and in 93, my Sun workstation got hit by lightning, and I decided that I had to replace it. And I didn't really fancy spending another 20 grand on another Sun workstation when I could spend three grand on a PC and run 386BSD. And so uh, that's when I discovered uh, the BSD make. And uh, it didn't take very long to decide that that was a winner. So BMake is um, basically NetBSD's make with autoconf added. Um, much as I liked building on BSD, uh, NetBSD in particular at the time, most of my clients uh, used crazy stuff like HPUX and UTS and AIX and all sorts of nonsense. Um, and so I wanted to be able to have a nice portable build that was as nice as the BSD build, but portable to everything under the sun. And that's what I got with BMake. I've, I've personally run it on everything from AIX to UTS um, and pretty much in between. Um, back in 2000, when I started at Juniper, um, their build was in a fairly sorry state. And I, my first project was to fix it. And uh, so it's been building with BMake since 2000. And uh, to a large extent, Juniper have pretty much funded me to develop um, Make for NetBSD and anybody else that wants it for, for the last 14 years. Um, I've put a lot of features into uh, NetBSD's Make in that interim. And one of the things that always surprised me was, um, although I didn't do a lot of evangelizing within the NetBSD community of these features, Almost without exception, within a week of me putting some new cool feature into Make, it was being absorbed into the NetBSD build without me even mentioning it. And I, I always thought that was pretty cool. Um, so up until fairly recently, um, the Juniper build had diverged considerably from FreeBSD. Juniper, we run Junos, which is basically FreeBSD. That, um, and we uh, modified the build considerably. And we never really bothered tracking the FreeBSD build until a few years ago when we decided that we wanted to move to a, an environment where we had FreeBSD building as close to stock FreeBSD as we could, and then adding our Juniper bits on top of it. And then all of a sudden, we had the situation of, well, we, can't, we don't want to have to continually retrofit our build to FreeBSD, and we don't think FreeBSD are quite ready for swallowing all of our build. Um, so let's see if we can meet somewhere in the middle. And so we, uh, 2011, I gave a talk here and we had a chat to some of the FreeBSD folk about the, whether there was any interest in picking up some of our build technology for FreeBSD. And uh, there was actually considerable interest. So we started the process. Um, and so uh, let's see, the first, the first commit of um, BMake into FreeBSD head, October 12, 2012. Um, we had a bit of a hiccup with the, uh, the ports. Um, we needed to get a ports run uh, to confirm that we weren't going to destroy ports. And they had to rebuild all their infrastructure, which, which delayed that for a while. But nonetheless, FreeBSD 10 shipped with building with BMake <coughs> by default. Um, it's been backported to 9.3, so the ports folk can use that. And 
I have to say none of this would have been successful without the, um, the goodwill and cooperation of both projects. Um, there's a number of changes that have gone into NetBSD's make to make it easier to do this project. Um, the NetBSD folk were uh, more than willing to absorb some of those changes. Um, and so uh, thanks to all of them on both sides. So why BMEC? Somebody asked this quite recently. Um, and uh, actually, Warner answered, on, answered it for me. Um, and he, he put it very well. Basically, um, uh, BMake is, is little more than NetBSD's make. NetBSD have a very active um, team of folk who are contributing regularly uh, to, to BMake. So it's not, a, um, it's not a, a situation if I get hit by a bus that everybody's screwed. Um, there's plenty of people around who, who understand it and can support it and maintain it. It has a plethora of uh, cool features. Not least is an abundance of modifiers. Um, and quite importantly, in that regard, uh, I forget, some years ago, I, I reworked the modifier handling so that you could use it recursively. And what that lets you do is stick complex constructions of modifiers into variables which you can then reuse without having to cut and paste them everywhere and getting them wrong. Um, Things like uh, multiple iterator values for for loops is quite nice. There's at least one for loop in the port stuff that would have been much nicer if it had been able to use that. Um, things like being able to auto ignore stale dependencies found via dot .depend is uh, actually very helpful. Um, you all, I, I did a, a clean on a, a FreeBSD tree that I've been doing for um, uh, you know, production builds for uh, a year now and I had to clean it for the first time uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was really annoying um, because I'd, we'd switched branches. I had to switch to a new branch, and I, there was something I had to clean. It was annoying. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about dirdeps.mk. Uh, it uses pretty much every single feature of BMake, um, and so it alone is a, is a cool reason to, to do this. So why um, Metamode and or Dirdeps? Um, it, it's worth noting, I, I usually talk about them as one and the same thing. They're not. You can actually use each of them independently. Um, you could use Dirdeps with a completely manually maintained build system. It would work very nicely. Um, but it's certainly nicer and easier if you have the Metamode, the metamode stuff as well. Um, together, they give you a very simple and reliable and maintainable solution to um, building complex chunks of software. Um, the FreeBSD build is, is you know, a decent size. The, the Junos build is a lot bigger. Um, and it's important. Uh, build, building large sets of software in parallel is actually a somewhat complex task. Um, but we like to make it as simple as possible. Um, one of the nice things about the, the Dirdeps um, build in particular is the build works exactly the same way regardless of where you start. So if you, if you like to you know, edit bin cat and run MetaX compile with an Emacs such that you're effectively doing a CD into bin cat and running make from there, it will do all the right stuff even if it's a clean tree. Um, similarly, if you're at the top level and you want to do a quote production build or you just want to build bin cat and so on, it works exactly the same way. Um, if you, uh, I'll probably cover it again. If you, if you look at the top level make files in, um, say, FreeBSD or NetBSD or you know, uh, Junos, if you could, in the pre meta mode days, they have some pretty large make files. I think FreeBSD's is currently up to about 1,800 lines. Um, the pre meta mode Junos build was 5,000 lines, and I could guarantee that there would be very few people in the company that could actually read it all and, and follow what was going on. Um, when we cut over to the meta mode stuff, that was reduced to less than 200 lines, uh, which is and 200 lines that virtually anybody could read. Um, so it's supportable. Um, I don't know about you guys, but um, so at, at Juniper, I have uh, close to 2,000 developers, and believe it or not, a lot of them don't log their builds, and most of them are not build geeks. And so when something goes wrong. They send an email to build trolls, I updated my tree and it doesn't work. 
yeah, a bit more info would help. We actually, actually, you'll see, um, I've got an example. We actually trained BMake uh, years ago to spew mountains of useful data that is exactly what we need to see when, you know, when you say, oh, my build broke, and we, we document all this stuff, and he says, like, if you want to report a build problem, BMake, when it, when it blew up, it spewed out all this info, please include all that in your, your problem report, and you'll get much faster resolution. Well, of course, you never get any of that. And when you ask them, well, where's your log? Oh, I don't have one. And so you're very often stuck with saying, well, go do it again, log it, and come back to me. Um, with the meta mode stuff, we actually log the critical info, whether they want us to or not. And so very often, all the uh, important data you need to analyze a failure is there, and uh, everything works better. All right, here's a quick teaser. Um, it's very hard to make a build log look interesting, I'm sorry. Um, we're, this is building uh, bin sh in a clean tree. I usually use bin cat, but some people think bin cat's a bit simple. So bin sh, it's a lot more complex. Um, so here we are building uh, bin sh in a clean tree. Uh, we just seed it into his direct, uh, well, actually we, yeah, we seed it into bin sh and we said make um, minus j8, and he just went crazy and, and did it all. And you can see, and uh, how long did it take? It took 58 seconds. Uh, it's not a particularly fast machine. Um, so that was building libc and all that sort of stuff. The things to note are the object directories were created automatically. There was no make depend done anywhere. Everything ran in, ran in parallel, but in the correct order. Um, the log was easy to read. There was no noise about compilers and all that sort of stuff. Um, we only built that which was necessary. And we visited the leaf directories directly. There's no tree walks involved. Um, and at the end there, in this slide, yep, you can see the last thing he did was update make file depend, or at least check whether it needed updating. All right, try it again. Um, so this is a quick look at one of those make file depends. This is actually, I think, the one for bin sh. Um, in the Junos build, uh, because we're always cross-compiling and we're always building for multiple architectures at the same time, uh, we actually, uh, by default, use a makefile.depend.dollarmachine so that we can have them updating in parallel without any concerns for contention. Um, when we looked at um, doing this for FreeBSD, we figured that was going to be a little bit too much. And so one of the exercises um, we went through was to look at making it all work with a, a simpler model. Um, and it's actually worked out very nicely, I think. So what we have here, it's, uh, you can see from the comment, it's an auto-generated make file. That means you don't touch it. Uh, the first thing it does there is it sets a, a variable um, that basically represents the relative location of this directory within the source tree. Um, and that's, that's key to, the, to how the whole thing works. Um, Parsder is uh, one of those magic variables that bmake sets for you. It represents the directory where it found the file that it's currently reading. Um, and if you, one of the modifiers that bmake has, it says you can take the value that you've got here and you can pass it to a real path and turn it into an absolute you know, um, path, which is extremely useful for this process. The key data in this file, apart from that, is dirdeps, which is a list of the directories and again, these are those relative directories relative to the top of the source tree that need to be built before we can build bin sh. And I mean, it's pretty simple to read. Um, the only complexity here, if you want to call it that, is uh, we substitute uh, the variable csudir for what it actually was. This allows us to use the exact same list of dependencies regardless of the architecture. Um, I386 is a bit of a wart in that it's for most architectures, the CSU dir is easily derivable from the machine value, um, not quite so for I386. And then the last thing it does is include dirdeps.mk, and uh, also at the end there, it will um, uh, capture, if necessary, any local dependencies. These are what allow us to do a parallel build in a clean tree without doing make depend. This this is effectively capturing just the stuff within, your lo within each directory, which are the sort of things that would normally break um, a parallel build in a clean tree. 
we'll, we'll look at this in more detail later. So building FreeBSD, um, Projects BMake, uh, as, I, as I briefly mentioned, is um, it's a test vehicle. It's, it's, a me it's um, an exercise in putting the, all of this um, build infra into a tree which is um, very close to head. It was synced last week from head. Um, and it uses all the meta mode and dirt depths and, and all that sort of thing. Um, the, the goal is to be able to easily cross build FreeBSD uh, as close to stock as possible. Um, and while minimizing changes to FreeBSD itself. Um, within Juniper, we have a team of uh, FreeBSD folk. We've been building um, head and stable 10 now, uh, and you know, from back around uh, 9. Um, using almost exactly the same setup. Uh, there's a bit more stuff there. For instance, we use external tool chains and we generate packages which are you know, basically ISO FSs and, and all that sort of stuff, and um, disk images for feeding into VMs. But from the pure build point of view, uh, there's very little difference. So just quickly, um, on, on the transition, for, for FreeBSD, we, we first talked about it with the FreeBSD folk in 2011. Um, converting the base to use BMake, which is the first step to be able to do any of this, uh, was actually very simple. It, it took a patch of less than 300 lines to um, allow the FreeBSD head to build using BMake instead of uh, FMake. I'm going to use FMake to represent the, the old FreeBSD make, just to avoid confusion. Um, ports was a little bit more complex. Um, because they have to support building on older versions of FreeBSD. Uh, at the time, it was 8.3, I think. Um, and they don't branch. So th that makes for a bit of a challenge. Um, more importantly, the, it's, it's reasonably simple to fix the base. It's a bit more complex to fix ports. Um, the most difficult problem is all of the thousands of people out in the world who are using FreeBSD and things derived from FreeBSD who we have no visibility into. And for those people, um, it's a bit rude to go and pull the rug out from under them. And so, as, as we'll see, the, uh, we made a number of changes to BMake to minimize the impact on those people uh, as we go. And so, again, just call if anybody does have horror stories or something like that, feel free to, to let us know so that we can maybe do something about them. Um, so there were changes made to BMake to support FreeBSD. Um, almost without exception, those changes go into NetBSD first and then get imported back in. One of the goals of the exercise is to minimize divergence between FreeBSD and NetBSD with respect to, to make um, so that we all benefit. Um, so both BMake and FMake are descended from Adam DeBoer's PMake from Sprite. Um, they've diverged quite a bit. Uh, one of the most obvious differences is the, the colon U and L modifiers, which I think FreeBSD got from OpenBSD around about the same time that I was sticking all the OSF <coughs> modifiers into BMake, which, oddly enough, had colon U and colon L as well. Fortunately, these aren't used by the base system at all, and as of last, last week or this week, Ports doesn't use them either. Um, but for the, for the purpose of our story, it's, it's still an issue, um, or it was an issue. Um, the other, I guess, key difference is um, BMake is um, aggressive, is putting it nicely um, with respect to dollar, dot .path. Um, it will find anything via dot .path that it possibly can, um, and that isn't always what you want. So. You sometimes have to curb his enthusiasm, and there's a dot no path thing to do that. Um, fortunately, um, just simply saying dot no path dollar clean files 99 covers 99 percent of the uh, the problem. Um, NetBSD's uh, BSD own dot make uh, marks all of the standard targets as both phony and not main. Um, so that was another change. Um, one of the one of the real fun ones is uh, handling job tokens. All modern makes, um, you know, when you do a make minus J8, you don't want every sub make to start another 8 and, and so on. You get, what is it, geometric um, increase in load. 
Um, so they, they use a means of having a, a token pool of some sort to constrain that. Um, both fmake and bmake do that, but they do it differently. fmake uses a FIFO, which the first instance, when fmake starts up, he has a look to see if there's the, the FIFO exists, and if it doesn't, he assumes he's the master, creates the FIFO, exports its name, and everybody else then uses it. Um, bmake, on the other hand, uses a pipe, and he passes a magic argument to his children uh, with the descriptors for the pipe. And so if bmake doesn't get that argument, he assumes that he's the master, and so he goes and creates it and passes it on to his children. Um, both systems work nicely, um, but they don't work well together. Um, in particular, if you, let's see, if you uh, had, um, if you had fmake as the initial instance, he would, you know, export the name of his uh, FIFO to the environment, go and start a bunch of submakes, and if they happened to be bmake, each of them would think that he was the master because he'd had no clue that he wasn't, and so he would start another n. Um, it almost uh, works the same going the other way, um, except that uh, fmake would blow up if bmake passed him his minus capital J argument. So you're sort of saved there by that incompatibility. But if you were careful to cleanse the environment that you passed to fmake to not have the minus j, then each fmake would think that he was the master and you'd have the same problem. Um, there's other useful stuff in there. Um, so a quick talk about the changes to, to the base. Um, any of the bmake specific uh, syntax, we bounded with if def um, dot parser. That's one of those magic variables that it, it defines for you. We added dot no path to all the generated files and phony and not main for the standard targets. We created a dot wait as a no op target for fmake so that um, you can stick dot wait um, into uh, subdo lists and other things like that. Um, and we ended up adding a, an option uh, with, without bmake so that people who, for whatever reason, didn't want to venture into the, the shark pool could avoid it for a while. Um, another change, uh, fmake uh, had a, a dependency, uh, sorry, a preference for BSD makefile before it looked for the traditional makefile and makefile. Um, bmake only looked for the traditional stuff, but it's configurable. So by simply sticking a, a list into sys.mk, <coughs> you can make it look for anything you want to. Um, and in, in all of these cases, if, if we could address a, an incompatibility by just sticking a, a magic variable in sys.mk, that was the preferred solution. For the job token one, um, that's pretty much what we had to do. Um, bmake, in particular, only passes his um, token pool descriptors to submakes if the target is tagged with dot make, the special source. Um, in FreeBSD, uh, fmake, the man page says exactly the same things that it, like, it's supposed to do the same things, but it doesn't seem to work, um, which is evidenced by the fact that somebody went and added this dollar, dollar, you know, underscore plus thing to basically do what dot make is supposed to do. Um, and so what that means is that the FreeBSD make files and presumably the thousands of make files were written by people who use FreeBSD but, you know, aren't in source. Um, have not been necessarily sticking dot make on all the targets where they would want um, dot make if it, if it had worked. Um, and so the only reasonable solution we could come up with for that one was to set a little knob in sys.mk to tell bmake to say, you know what, just pass your, your descriptors to all the, all the children. And that sort of makes the problem go away. Um, oh, the error token is a nice one. Um, so. Um, normally, when bmake fails, he sticks, uh, this is in jobs mode, he sticks an error token back into the, the token pool. And the next time all the other submakes go to take a token out of the pool, they get the error token, they say, oh my god, and they bail. Which is wonderful, because your build stops immediately um, on, on error, which 99.999% of the time is exactly what you want. Apparently it's not what you want for make universe, though. Um, in that case, uh, people would prefer that if, you know, MIPS, some variable of MIPS is broken, that ARM and I386 and all the rest could just chug along and, and get as far as they could. And so we, we added another knob to say, you know what, if this 
make job error token is set to false, then don't stick an error token into the pool when you die. And so in the top level make file, if it sees that you're doing make universe, it'll set that knob to false. And so you can get the make universe behavior that you want and still get the, the nice behavior for all the normal cases. Um, oh, another, this is another fun one. Um, so um, in the long ago, uh, make use set minus e to you know, fail things on, on statements. Um, I don't recall exactly why, uh, but uh, I think it was mainly to get more consistency in um, target handling between jobs mode and compat mode. Um, in NetBSD, they, they did away with all that, and they, they made it work uh, very reliably, such that the, um, the unit of failure was the command line rather than statements within the command line. Um, so with fmake, you could do cd you know, to some bogus directory, semicolon, rm minus rf star, and it would be reasonably safe because, unless you had a directory called that, um, it would fail at the cd and never get to the rm minus r star. If you fed that same command to bmake, though, he would happily remove everything in the current directory, uh, which may or may not be good. Well, the object directory, anyway, um, if you had one. The, um, the uh, format at the bottom is, of course, safe with any version of make um, and is therefore preferable. And while it would have been a quite simple exercise to go through all the make files in FreeBSD and fix them so that they, they did the latter form instead of the former, Again, that doesn't do anything for the thousands of people out in the world who may not get the memo. Um, and so we had to do something about that. So we, uh, we just, again, this is one of those things that you can configure with make. So we just defined a shell for FreeBSD to use by default, which effectively makes bmake behave the way fmake does um, and use set minus e by default. Um, the option, the bmake option. So I think when we originally proposed adding bmake to FreeBSD to you know, start this transition process, we sort of had in mind that we would just add bmake, it would get installed as bmake, and people could choose whether they used it or not, and, and so on. Um, that wasn't um, considered ideal um, by the project. They wanted us to do the cutover as soon as possible and effectively, you know, one day you'd go to bed and it was fmake and you'd wake up the next day and it's bmake. Um, and that would have been feasible for the project itself, but um, it's a bit more of a challenge, for, again, for the third parties. Um, and so we ended up having to add that option to, so that people who didn't want to face the, the transition right now um, could avoid it. Um, and so we added this option. Source makefile had to do the right thing, uh, which um, typically involved um, it, has a, it has a dance for when you're upgrading to recognize that the make that you have on the system is not quite adequate for building the new version of software and it would go and bootstrap a new version of make and so on. And once it would, existed, it would use it. But it always called it make. And so he would say, oh, I have this temporary version of make, I'll go use it, um, even though it might have been six years old. Um, so uh, we fixed that so that if you wanted to be building with fmake, it made sure that temporary make was called fmake. And if you wanted bmake, it would make sure that temporary make was called bmake. And if you change your mind, it would do the right thing. Um, that's all been ripped out now. Thank you, Warner. Sure. Um, the, uh, apparently, it was broken for a while. Anyway, nobody, nobody noticed. Um, so obviously, that's OK. It's OK. It, it's gone. So we, we, we've, we've, you know, we've uh, burned the bridge. Um, so that's progress. Um, I mentioned the colon U and L for, for ports. Um, uh, I'd, I'd had a cunning plan for how to deal with bootstrapping ports, um, uh, which worked brilliantly unless you were the ports folk, um, because of the way that they want to be able to build ports. And so that wasn't going to work. Uh, so yet again, we added a, a local hack to um, be able, for ports to be able to set a knob saying, you know, I, I really want the old colon U and colon L. And even with this set, actually, uh, in many circumstances, bmake can do the right thing because it can tell whether it's looking at a colon U with a value after it 
or whether it's looking at a colon U with nothing in which case it might be the old modifier. Um, but again, uh, that's due to be removed um, after I get back from this conference. <coughs> um, another thing that FMAKE had which uh, NetBSD make didn't have was uh, the tolerance for quoted strings um, as iterator variables. Um, and so that was added to, to NetBSD. Um, and then I think well, the, one of the final ones was the minus V behavior. If you do minus, uh, you know, F make minus V foo, it spits out the fully resolved uh, value for you. If you do the same thing for B make, it will give you the literal value, which may or may not include other variables. This is brilliant if you want to do, um, you know, debugging of what's going on. Um, I use it a lot. Um, and with bmake, you can always do, you know, put um, dollar foo in there to expand it fully. So this is great for, you know, command line type stuff, but it's not necessarily ideal for the build itself. Um, for the build itself, the fmake behavior is actually better. And so I proposed, you know, changing the default behavior and adding a, a debug flag so that you could get back the <coughs> give me the literal value. Um, we compromised by adding yet another knob to say which behavior you like. So FreeBSD sets make expand variables to true, in which so you get the, the default FreeBSD behavior. Uh, but regardless of the setting, you always have the debug flag to give you the literal value. And so both projects are able to have the, the, the um, semantics that they know and like. Um, oh yes, this was, this was the, the last one. Um, uh, so, uh, BMake, uh, some years ago, um, they switched the way uh, iterator variables within for loops are handled to avoid uh, namespace pollution. Um, and so they use this uh, colon u va value. So that what the colon u does is say, if the variable doesn't have a value, use what follows as the value. And so we have a, effectively a null variable, and so we're going to use value as the value. Um, and this avoids, as I say, namespace pollution. Trouble is, it makes it very difficult to try and play games like escaping iterator variables within for loops, and especially when you have nested for loops and you've got to do, you know, multiple escapes to try and escape the escapes within the escapes within the for loops and so on. Um, and I looked at this one for a while and I thought, you know what, let's, let's forget it, let's just use the inline loops, which are much easier to follow and um, uh, so we basically re I basically replaced a 20 line block of nested for loops with a single line. Uh, which produces exactly the same output, of course. Uh, oh. Oh, okay. All right, all right. Do we have a, did we have a pointer? There, there was a pointer at some stage. Um, there is one? Doesn't matter. I, I can reach. All right, so this thing is the inline loop modifier. Um, the first thing that follows it is going to be the iterator vari variable. And then everything between the next at and a closing one, and this isn't the closing one because this is introducing a nested loop, um, <laughs> onto the end. So the, the, the closing one is like this followed by another colon, for example. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Hope I don't kill anybody. Ah, yeah, right oh, excellent. All right. Oh, this, this is so cool. All right. So uh, in. Um, in the man page, we mentioned that in the OSF development environment where this came from, they actually use a, a um, convention of uppercase variable name with dots either end for the iterator, iterator, iterator variable. That's really hard to say. Um, but that's really hard to type. I'm, I'm lazy, so I prefer single character iterator variables because then you can just use dollar $p unless you need to do modifiers on it. Um, so anyway, this is two nested loops. Uh, the, so the first thing we do is for the mlang stuff, we're going to uh, stick man slash at the start of it. And if we find that we've got an empty one, we get rid of it. And then for those, so each, each value that we got of that is going to be an m valuable. And then we're going to also iterate through the m links. And hang on, we're going to, uh, what are we doing? Yeah, so each of those is going to be p. So we've got a p, so there's another loop. So We've got p, colon e is the extension of p. Um, and so this is actually referencing a man dollar p blah prefix. 
and then we've got M, which is our, you know, from M Lang, uh, and then again we stick the P with his extension at the end. And unfortunately, when I did it full screen on my terminal with the normal font, you could actually see the end of the line, um, and it finishes with a couple of colon closed brackets. Um, I don't know. Um, the, the, this, the, the colon at, the colon at, colon u, colon l, colon d, and um, colon p all came from uh, the OSF version of, of pmake. Um, and the, the inline loop operator is particularly wonderful um, because unlike a for loop where everything is getting expanded as you read the for loop, in this case, the loop is expanded at the time of reference. And so you can do some very cool stuff with it that you can't possibly do with uh, normal dot for loops. So this is saying for each end in what precedes it rather than for each end in general. And then it's for each P within the Yes. Yeah, I figured you guys would be computer science, but you'd probably be able to get the hang of it. Yeah, both, both of them have their place, don't get me wrong. Um, dot for loops are, are definitely useful uh, at times. Um, but there are, there are things that, you know, to do it with a dot for loop, you have to do um, obscene things, uh, which are just quite natural with the inline loops. All right, so why is BMake so cool? Um, well, it can do dirt apps. That's reason enough. Um, you can see Durdeps in, in the tree. It's in contrary of BMake MK, Durdeps MK. Uh, I don't recommend reading it on an empty stomach. Um, I've been doing this sort of stuff for, for 20 odd years, and I consider Durdeps one to read, you know, on a, on a um, you know, full stomach. Um, but anyway. Uh, we have, a, as I mentioned, we have a plethora of modifiers. One of the ones that uh, somebody <coughs> added not that long ago is this one. So I saw in FreeBSD they have a, a fixed value that you use for the random seed for C++ compiler. Um, this allows you to have a repeatable build, but have a different, different anonymous initializer seed for every library uh, that you build, um, which is actually quite a nice thing. Um, this one, this is, this is an example of using um, the parseDir and parse file. This just ends up being a token that you can use, you know, if you want to create a little marker target in a makefile.inc, for example, to test whether that makefile.inc has been included already. Um, this, you can, you can make a target that includes this dollar this, or you can, you can spell this all out, but it's, it's more readable to just say this. Um, this will ensure that you'll, you'll get a target that is the same value regardless of whether you read it via an absolute path, a relative path, or any combination thereof, because the colon TA turns it into an absolute path using real path. So you can canonicalize it. Um, this one's an example of, um, as I mentioned, you can stick complex lists of modifiers into a variable and then reuse it. And I, there's an example down here. So here's a list with a number of variables. And we basically just apply this set of modifiers to it. And we get a list of um, exclusions. Um, and that, that sort of thing gets used quite heavily by Durdeps and lots of other cool stuff. Um, it can do the equivalent of STRF time using either local time or GM time. Um, this, uh, in the Junos build, we like to have timestamps on the build logs so that we can see where all the time's going. Um, this allows us to have those timestamps in the output logs for essentially free, and so we, we do it. Um, and we use, we use this format typically so that you, you get a human readable thing, you get something you can actually do math with, and a handy little token to be able to grep them out. And um, one of the tools I have in my kit bag is a little um, Python script which will read one of these logs, and it can basically give you a progress bar so you can see how long the build's got to go um, until it's done. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to get through all these slides. I, I've stuck a, a number of slides in at the, towards the end uh, to just cover random stuff that people may or may not be interested in. So don't, don't be concerned that we're going to run out of time, because we will. 
Um, so it was last thing, the Project BMake branch is, is the one that hopefully most of you are interested in. Um, this was last synced about a week ago, and as of this morning, it completely builds again. Um, the transition to Clang um, threw some spanners into the work, but I got some help from David uh, last night to, to sort that out and uh, finally finished getting it all building again. Um, as I mentioned, unlike the Junos build where we use uh, this format of makefile.depend pretty much universally, um, in FreeBSD we use this format. There are, I think, about five places where we do this, and that's invariably because uh, in, there are places where the auto-generated, the locally generated um, files that you need to capture dependencies for have names that vary with the architecture. And so um, the, way, the way the build infra here works is if you had previously built you know, a, one of these directories for, say, i386, and therefore there was a makefile depend dot i386, and then you then went and built it for MIPS, when he gets to the end and says, oh, I need to update you know, makefile dot depend, he says, oh, I see there isn't one, but I see there's a makefile.depend dot some other machine. I better do the same thing. And he'll just automatically create a makefile.depend dot MIPS for you. And so um, all the right stuff happens. Uh, the package's makefile acts as a top level makefile. In the Junos build, the source makefile just includes packages makefile. Um, it just makes it simpler from, from, uh, from transition point of view. And in the FreeBSD build, we do the same thing. We leave the FreeBSD top level make files alone um, so that we can still do build world, so we can make sure we're not breaking FreeBSD when we want to commit stuff back up from that environment. But we don't want to use it for our, for our own stuff. So this, this does the job. Um, under packages, uh, in, the, in, the, in the normal world, you would have um, a whole bunch of packages, you know, foo, to build a package called foo. Um, we use the sudo directory as a place to put tar this, this, these all represent targets because they happen to have a makefile.depend file under them. And so when you, when you go into um, packages and you say make bootstrap tools, for example, it knows that that's uh, something it can build. And it also knows because it's got dot .host that it's something that it has to build for the magic machine called host, which happens to be whatever host you're building on, um, as opposed to a you know, the, the host may be i386 or AMD64, but it's not necessarily the same thing as an i386 or AMD64 target because you may be building FreeBSD 10, but you might be building on FreeBSD 7, which is unfortunately what we're doing at the moment. Um, but it doesn't matter because it works. Um, oops. So. For the environment, um, I, I think in most of these examples, I use a little uh, tool called MK. Um, its joy in life is to, from wherever it is, to have a look upwards until it file, finds a file called sandbox-env. And wherever it finds that file defines the top of the quote sandbox. And he sets a variable sb to that location. And then he reads that file up to condition his environment. Um, this is great if you're an Emacs user and you're editing branch. I, I have you know, trees from NetBSD, Junos, FreeBSD all over the shop, and you can be edit, editing them all within the same Emacs and just do MetaX compile in any of them, and it'll just do the right thing. Um, but if you don't like using wrappers and so on, all you really need to do is make sure that you have uh, make syspath set, and everything else that needs to be done can be done by um, bmake via, <coughs> excuse me, you know, say local sys.mk or, or anything else. Um, Projects BMake has a local sys.mk, which I've checked into the tree. Um, the main reason is it contains a lot of stuff which we don't, which I haven't um, taken care of yet. Um, but generally speaking, you can build all of user land, kernel, um, tool chains for both the host and target. Um, I added a boot. Uh, Clang 3.3 .3 is unable to build Clang 3.4, it seems, or at least um, the table gen can't, can't handle um, the headers and so on. So you actually need, you very likely need to bootstrap um, the tool chain in order to be able to get building with the new Clang. So I added a target to do that. And since bootstrapping tool chains is, you know, 
not a wheel worth reinventing. I just made it leverage the existing targets in the source makefile link one. Um, we're now using sysroot, uh, which works much better with Clang than pretty much any alternative. Um, you can do build world. Uh, you can have build world work like build world, but produce meta files uh, along the way. And that's actually very useful both for comparing against when you're scratching your head as to why Clang built when you did build world versus not building when you didn't. Uh, you can actually go look at all the syscalls involved and see what went, was going wrong. Um, it also gives you a means for bootstrapping makefile.depend if you were wanting to start this exercise all over again. Um, so here's a, a quick thing about getting started. So minimal environment setup. Once you've got that, you should be able to just do like make um, bootstrap tools. You'd want to do at least J8 because it's going to take a little while. Um, if you're not using my little MK wrapper um, and you want to then build the tool chain again, and you remember the days of building GCC where you used the host compiler to build stage one and then use stage one to build stage two and eventually, same sort of thing. You could, uh, you know, you could uh, skip this step, but you would have to add this with tools to, to these ones to basically use the set of tools that you built in, in this stage. Um, it's probably neater to go through this step once and then put it all aside and, and be done with it. And then you can have fun, you know, CDing to random places and building them or the lot is a pseudo target that just basically builds everything. Um, and again, it should all just build in, in um, clean tree. Um, debugging failure. They, I was talking to Clancy or Casey or somebody um, last night, and so I, I gave him this example as to how it's cool. So I, I mentioned before, Nobody logs their builds, and, and they, they get build failures, and they give you absolutely useless information. Um, these days, though, as long as they can tell you where their tree is, we can go find the clues. Um, and as an example, we'll edit bin cat and stick a, a bogus you know, include in there, and then we go and compile it, and lo and behold, it explodes. Um, oops, yeah, couldn't find that. Um, and bmake spews out, this is some of the, the noise I mentioned that bmake spews out on failure. This is all configurable, of course. Um, by default, it doesn't do any of this. You, you have to set some variables. But you can set it to spit out any variables you like. Um, so we have a number that we, we like to see. The, the level is useful, the current directory, the object directory. Um, so it spits out the target that it was building, the meta file that it was creating, and um, it will actually copy this meta file into a, um, an error directory at the top of the tree so they're easy to find. And if you're doing things like, I, I have a um, continuous build machine, and so he knows to go, you know, the build failed. The first thing he does is look in the error directory. If there's anything in there, that's why the build failed. Um, makes the analysis very simple. And so here's the meta file that got copied into, you know, source top dot dot error um, with a name that we can easily find. And yes, there we go. You know, e even if the guy had, you know, hadn't logged his build and this error had actually happened 5,000 lines earlier and is you know, not possibly in his scroll back anymore, we can still go find what the exact error was, why it was happening. We can go and see which version of the compiler he was running and all of the, the files that were being read and so on. And it may be that, oh, yes, you've got the wrong version of the compiler, or no, you twit, you spelt oops wrong. But one way or another, you have the information that you need to be able to work out what was wrong and, and do something about it. Um, for next steps, um, uh, we'd like to, we think it would be useful to actually add a bit more to it um, so that you could, for instance, have a target in the Project Speedmake branch that would let you go and effectively just build a little um, bootable VM image that you could then throw into um, Beehive, um, which would be quite useful. Um, another thing that may or may not be interesting uh, is distributed building. This is actually very easy to do uh, with Dirdeps, um, uh, but that's probably the subject for a whole new talk. Um, but if anybody's interested, I can bend your ear on that. How are we going? Uh, okay, so um, now, now we're into this, the, just the almost random stuff. Um, but one of the things I was talking about with uh, Warner recently, and he's he's thankfully been doing, 
is um, separating the bsd.star stuff from, so y you can think of these things as classes of make files. You, the bsd star dot mk files are things for building stuff in the BSD way. Um, but you don't necessarily want to have them only able to build user source. Um, and uh, you can have source dot, you know, ops, for example, as options which only apply to building user source uh, that you don't necessarily install, but are still useful. Um, and similarly, you can have local dot star dot mk, local dot com for anything else you like. Um, as things which are either site local or tree local. They're not part of the, the repository um, per se, um, but they allow you to do things like uh, customization without hacking the original source. If you look at um, dirdeps.mk, most of the meta uh, um, and uh, you know, similar make files, I include a dot local, you know, whatever the name of the thing is, to allow um, customization without having to touch the original make file which in the case of something like Dirdeps is, is very important because, um, like I said, I, I only touch it when I'm sober. And I would recommend others do the same. Actually, I would recommend not touching it. Uh, so source ops, um, this is something that uh, has been very handy. Um, it fits, it's now something that we can include for, within those makefile.depends that we use in the pseudo target. So for instance, this one is uh, for the tool chain. So we can now say, well, you know, is, is make clang defined? No, it's not. Oh, gosh, let's go include source ops. Now we know it will be defined, and we say, is clang yes? OK, we'll add clang to the set of stuff we're going to build. Is GCC yes? We'll add GCC, and, and so on and so forth. And that way, you can, you can easily handle building um, all the optional stuff. Um, one of the other things that we saw earlier was um, auto creation of object directories. Um, a nice feature of bmake is any target that you, any source that you give to the special target objder sets the objder. Um, it has to exist, of course. Um, so this little dance up here makes sure that it exists. And this is how we do auto creation of object directories. If you are going to do this sort of dance, though, you have to do it very early in the game um, because it, this has to be done before you start reading make files that are going to potentially influence dot path. Um, because when you do dot path, you know, some directory, if it doesn't exist, it doesn't get added. And there are cases where it will exist, but if you, if you do it too late in the game or too early in the game, you'll get a path that's in the source tree rather than the object directory, which was uh, what was intended. So again, if you want to play um, with auto object directories, uh, you really need to do it during the sys.mk phase. Um, but this, this works really well. Uh, we haven't, um, I was talking to, uh, uh, again, chap last night, um, 10, 10 something years ago um, within Junos, we, we went through the whole phase of, you know, you had the, the camp of people who like to dribble object directories in the source tree. You had the camp who, you know, like to have just a single directory called obj. And then you had the other guys who were building multiple architectures, so they wanted obj dot dollar machine and, and so on. So, we got to a point of having five different ways to support building the tree um, for, for all these various combinations, and it, it just got ridiculous. Uh, so we just said, forget it. We're going to create object directories automatically, and uh, you know, no questions asked. And the, it allows you to simplify things enormously, and simple is good. All right, so um, since nobody's asking any questions, I'll, I'll, I'll waffle a bit about meta mode. Um, Basically, what we do is when we build a target, we create, amazingly enough, a file called you know, target.meta. Um, and it, can, it collects stuff like the, the expanded command line, which if all you did would be useful because that, sort of, that allows you to say, um, all right, last time I built this target, I used that command line. Now I'm building it, and I'm going to use this command line, and they're different. The target is out of date. Um, and this allows you to do things like skipping. Uh, you've all seen make files where you have comments like, oh, if any of the make files change, we better regenerate this in case. Um, and that can lead to all sorts of unnecessary compilation. By being able to be sure that, that the target is out of date because its command line actually was impacted, you have a much better situation. Um, 
We capture any command output, uh, which you know, nine times out of 10 is just the error. Um, in most cases, it's empty. And we capture all the interesting system calls. By interesting, I mean the ones that are interesting to make. Um, and most typically, he's interested in read, execute. Um, he has to track um, changes of directory so that he can work out path names and stuff like that. But mostly read and execute is, is what he cares about. Um, and why do we do this? Well, um, the automated capture of all this information helps us optimize the build and improve reliability. And by optimizing the build, I mean doing as little as possible, doing it in parallel, but doing it correctly. Um, and capturing the, the command output, again, makes failure analysis um, much easier, even when people refuse to log their builds. Um, meta mode and dirt apps help with all of the above. Um, as, as I mentioned, we, we don't do make depend. We, the only, sorry, we, we still do make depend within our build uh, for the kernel because at least last time I looked, there were certain files that only get generated via the make, uh, you know, the make depend phase of the kernel. Um, but I'm told by O'Brien that maybe even that's not necessary anymore, so we may be ditching that soon. Um, but for the rest of the tree, we, don't, we, we never do make depend, um, and it's, it saves you a lot of time. Um, and while even before we had all this, we were using our GCC to, to dribble out um, info so that you could auto gather dependency information. Um, using the FileMon kernel module lets you gather um, all that information for everything, not just the compiler. Uh, let's see, and so you automatically catch tool chain changes, all that sort of stuff. Also, here's the example of you know an unnecessary. Um, uh, recompile that you can avoid. Um, you can use things like you know DP add uh, to bootstrap your dependencies if you if you're just getting started. And um, interestingly enough, you can you can get into problems where if you have actually spurious entries in DP add, you know you've said oh DP add I need lib foo mumble, but you don't actually use it. Um, it won't be captured in the auto captured dependencies because you didn't use it. And then you get to the, the ultimate directory and it says, well, I can't do anything because foo mumble's not there. It says, well, that's because you didn't need it. Um, so we actually, um, once we've finished processing dirt at, uh, DP add to uh, you know, add C flags and stuff that we may or may not want to as a result, we actually throw it away to avoid those sort of errors. Um, some targets uh, will need work. Um, for instance, uh, it's, it's quite common to have you know, a target that is going to include some kind of timestamp. Um, you may or may not want that target to be regenerated every time you build. If you don't, you can, you can actually tell uh, make, you know, for this particular target, I don't want you to do command line comparison because that would make you do the wrong thing as far as I'm concerned. You can actually be clever about it um, make knows that if, you, if your target actually involves the .00 .00.date, does anybody use that these days? Um, it it's basically expands to the list of uh, sources that are out of date with respect to the target. And therefore, the expansion of it is, is going to be different almost every time you do it. And so there is no way that you can reasonably compare a command line that involves you, any use of this variable. So B make knows this, and so if he spots this variable in the script, he'll say, well, I can't compare that command line, I'll skip it. Which means that you can cheat, because you can deliberately stick that variable in there, match something that will never be in there, and so you actually have a token here which will never expand to anything in the command line, but it'll be seen by B make, and he'll say, oh, he doesn't want to compare this command line. Um, but you can still come. So in this, in this target here, we won't regenerate just because the timestamp changed, but if you change anything DP add, that changes the command line, and so we will, will regenerate the, the target. Um, you enable it just by setting the word meta in a variable called make.mode. It gets read very late during the, uh, it, sorry, it gets read by all the make files. It gets um, looked at after you've read all the make files. So your make files can control this variable uh, at pretty much any time. Um, and effectively, uh, meta.sys.mk does a bit more, but the, the key bit it does is it says, well, the target all depends on dirt depths, and then we're going to wait 
for that to finish. As in, we're not going to do anything else until dirt eps is finished. And that is, you know, that line there, if you like, is the magic that makes the whole thing work. Well, there's a bit more to it, but you get the idea. Um, so when we write them, for dollar target, we create dollar target dot meta. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we skip it normally for any uh, quote special target like begin, end, error. Um, unless you also sometimes you do want uh, a meta file for these, in which case you can always stick the special source dot meta on there to say, I really want a meta file for this. Um, it's never created if the flag if the target is flagged. No meta. I don't care what you think, I don't want a meta file for this, please. Um, and normally, meta files are skipped if the object directory and the current directory are the same. Um, but in the case of, for instance, building the kernel, uh, where we, we try to leverage the existing kernel build to the extent possible, so we actually do the CD into the object directory and run make in there. And in that case, we do want meta files, and so we stick a little knob in make mode to say, making meta files in the current directory is OK. Um, and lastly, if the target that you're building is outside of your object directory, he will create a, a meta file with all the slashes replaced with underscores, just so that you end up with a file that you can reference within that directory. I think we've covered the content. Um, important to note, uh, there are two variables that are used to track meta files. Meta, make meta files contains a list of all the meta files that we uh, read or examined or in any way knew anything about while we were uh, building this particular directory. And <coughs> excuse me, make meta created is all the ones that we updated. And so this allows us, when we get to the end of having built this particular directory, if this variable is empty, we did nothing. We know that we don't need to go and consider whether we should update the makefile.depends, which can be a reasonably expensive process, so we skip it when we can. Um, oh, if the meta, verb, if the meta, we're being meta verbose, then uh, we'll expand the make meta prefix, which defaults to just building target name, but you can make it do anything you like. And in fact, I have a fairly cunning make file that sets this to a variable that actually is used to track all of the directories that you visited during the build, so that you can then go back and re-examine them to see if there's any files that you should have SVN added but hadn't, so you can throw an error. Um, that's, that's another very cool trick. Um, a little bit about FileMon. It's a reasonably simple um, kernel module. The original prototype that John Birrell did uh, of this idea used Dtrace. Um, Dtrace uh, mostly works. Um, it doesn't seem to let you reliably get the uh, absolute path of the, the process that you're, the program that you're invoking. There's also a little bit of overhead, but more importantly, it needed special privileges to be able to, to do this, and we didn't necessarily like any of those, so we, um, we did this kernel module. It's available for FreeBSD, NetBSD, and there is a Linux version, which they promised me they will make public, um, and I, I, I will nag them continually until they do, um, because it's, it's actually quite useful. Um, each record in the, the meta file that we get from FileMon um, is, the, the, the whole thing is designed to be easily parsed by a shell script, and the original thing that did the post-processing these was a shell script. So we have a single character to denote the system call that we did, and then typically you get, so the, the tag, the process ID, and the data, and the data is nine times out of 10 just a path name. In the case of linking and moving, it's two path names um, with quotes, just in case there were spaces in the names. Um, and then, uh, oh, uh, in the NetBSD version, I don't bother with stat calls because they fill the, the thing tremendously, but they're not particularly useful to, to make. But they are interesting uh, from a human point of view, I guess. Uh, when we read them, OK, so when we read them, um, uh, so. And we only read them if BMake thinks that the target is possibly up to date. So if, if uh, you're reading a make file and it's a clean tree, for example, all the targets are going to be out of date. He's never going to look for any meta files because he's just going to go and do it. But if the normal rules for make look at all the, the directory and so on and thinks that the target is up to date, 
then and only then will he go look at a metafile and he'll go and read it and one of the first things he does is compare the command line if the command line's different and you haven't told him not to he'll say it's out of date go do it uh, he skips past the command output and he gets to the system calls and he needs to be able to parse the system call stuff and for each file that you read or um, executed if it's newer than the target then the target's out of date if um, one of the interesting ones is, yeah, so we have this, this concept of a, a bailiwick. Anybody like the history? Um, that defines to bmake the sphere of his influence. So if he's, if he's responsible for populating the, that directory over there on the table and he's reading a meta file that put a file over there and it's gone, that means he needs to redo it. And so the target will be out of, out of date as a result. Um, Yep, that covers that. Uh, so one of, the, one of the nice things that we can do with this, you, you can, as, I, as I mentioned, you could write all these make file depends manually if you wanted to, um, but it's nicer to do it automatically. So when we finish building, we have a, a tool that can go and read these things. And uh, he can look at the make.meta uh, created to know that he has to do something, but he actually looks at the full list to go have a look at what he needs to read to get all of the, the dependency stuff. Um, and this whole process is greatly simplified by having your object directories and your source trees not overlapping. So object directories within the source tree uh, complicate the thing. So it's much nicer to use something like um, the, the model we use where your object directories are either completely aside using you know, make obj to prefix or the, the fancy make obj do that we use where you have essentially parallel trees. Um, so here's an example of one. I forget what this was. Oh, this was building something in BNSH. Um, so you can see the, the things that he read. Um, any, anything that he reads out of an object directory that isn't the current object directory defines something that needs to have happened before this directory can be built. And that's, that's the essential idea. Um, and we extract those and we stick them into DIRDEPS. Um, you can also have me extract a variable called source DIRDEPS uh, if you're doing things like uh, originally, well we still do, originally within the Junos world we, we support the idea of subset trees where you can say I just want to check out enough of the tree to be able to build bin cat. Everybody needs to be able to bin, build bin cat. Um, and so you can look at the source DIRDEPS for bin cat and say oh well that means I need libc and I need blah 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 and you can follow exactly the same logic for checking out the tree as for, for building it. Um, but we haven't done that for a while and, and we decided because these actually result in far more churn than, than these do, we, we actually took them out. Um, and we don't bother collecting them in the, the projects BMake branch. Um, mapping object to source to, uh, if you're reading things out of the object directory where they, where they were created, it's a very simple exercise. You typically just substitute object top for source top and you've, you've got the directory um, because, again, we, we keep everything nice and neat. Um, if you're pulling things out of a stage tree, for example, which is, you can just think of it as a, a dester that you've done auto-install into, um, you need a little bit of help because uh, there isn't necessarily a directory in the source tree that corresponds to user slash include. So what we do when we stage files is we stick a file called .dirdep and when the, the tool that processes these things, when he goes and reads and he says, oh, the guy used a file from here called uni standard, he says, is there a uni standard .h .dirdep? Oh my gosh, there is. Let's have a look. And that gives him the value that he needs to stick into dirdeps. And so he can proceed without any further ado. Um, logs are still useful, though. Um, uh, in particular, uh, we can do things like capturing the number of meta files that we examined for building libc, how many we actually created. So you can tell from the discrepancy in the numbers that this was an update build. Um, it's nice to see lots of directories where you spent zero seconds doing absolutely nothing um, because that means that you don't have bugs in your make files that are causing things to be built unnecessarily. Um, Over. Oh my gosh! Could have said something. All right. I, I'm 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 carrying. Anybody interested or want questions or anything like that? Because I can skip straight to the end.
Where are we? Yep. So you can handle the provider itself with one of the dependencies. Yes. Um, so for, you can do a distribution split with you, not, not assuming anything about the build. So you could, like, you're at the same compiler and you could every single one if you wanted. You could, if, you do, if you do distributed compilation, like using, um, say, something like DCC, you can, you can do that. Um, yeah, is that. DCC, you have to assume the other side has the compiler that you do. Yes, absolutely. Um, if you do distributed dump build system, that is just a remote execution, yep. then you can send the compiler over and uh, you cache mechanism so you don't do it. All yeah, so, well, the way we do that is. Um, you know, if, if I'm the master of the build and I'm going to ask you to build something, I actually make you look at my tree and you will read the list of tool chains that you're supposed to use from that and you will use the same tool chains by, de by, um, you know, by default. Otherwise, you'll explode and we won't do anything. Um, the, this, you can do the same thing with you know, DCC, as in you, you send the job to a machine that you know has the tool chain that you want to have used. Um, there's there's an, any number of ways to, to, to skin that cat. Um, any other questions? All right, hang on. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Ta-da, there you go. All right, so um, it may be the greatest thing since sliced bread, sliced bread but it's maybe not for everybody. Um, but it does uh, provide a simple solution to some rather complex problems. And if anybody has any questions, there's some further reading, and you can always catch me at SJG at FreeBSD, NetBSD, Juniper, and so on and so forth. Thank you. <laughs>